I'd like to welcome you to the Midweek Bible Study of the Mount Carmel Church. We're so glad that you're able to watch and to listen tonight. As we continue with our study in the book of Colossians, we'll be looking at Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through verse 23 again tonight. And uh, looking at this area as we've entitled our series in the book of Colossians, Jesus is Enough. But the question for us, I hope you remember the question that I asked last week. Well, I'll be asking it again tonight. And uh, just, again, a reminder to us, this important question in our lives spiritually. But I want to thank you for watching and listening. Our, our weather has changed again, and we're into a, a cold spell. So uh, that's coming on fall, winter kind of thing. And as we, even if we don't like cold weather, it's here. But uh, just a, a great change in, this, in the weather also as far as from season to season. But thank you for watching and listening tonight. Let's have a word of prayer as we start our evening Bible study. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight. We thank and praise you for this night. We thank you that we can come and to worship you through your word. Dear Lord, I pray for open hearts for what we would find here tonight in this passage of Scripture. I also pray for clarity of voice tonight. But we thank you for each and every step, each and every part of our, our lives. And dear Lord, as we look to you, we ask for wisdom. We ask for guidance. We ask for direction in our lives. And Lord, you know each and every person that is watching and listening tonight. You know each and every need. You know each and everything that is going on even right now in their life. And dear Lord, we just ask for your continued guidance in their lives, in their families. It may be decisions that they're making or getting ready to make. But we want to thank you for all that you do for us. Lord, we ask for just continued guidance in this nation. We pray for a nation that has seen many things change and many things be flipped upside down. And Lord, as Christians, I pray that we are praying for those in leadership, those that have authority over us. I pray that we're praying for our local churches, Lord, because churches are looked at differently today, kind of as a second or third choice, maybe on a Sunday or a second and third choice any other time of the week. But Lord, we pray for uh, continued guidance in our local churches. I pray for the Mount Carmel Church. Lord, that we would continue to stand on your word. And I pray for local churches, Bible-believing churches, that they would be willing to stand on your word, Lord, and stand strong. We pray for those in school, Lord. I think of colleges. And as our young adults go off to college, Lord, many times it changes things or the way they look at life, and Lord, help them to look to your word and not to the world. We pray for our children, Lord, and teenagers that are in school right now, and Lord, we just ask for your guidance for them. I pray for teachers and administrators and those on school board and those on support staff, Lord, that you would continue to guide and direct in each and every part of their lives, Lord, and we just pray for protection for our children we pray for the country of Israel, Lord, and, and just continued guidance there. And uh, we just want to lift tonight up to you and thank you for all that you do. And, and Lord, how that we do know that Jesus is enough. Help us to show that in our lives. Help our lives to just, again, radiate your love to others. But we thank and praise you for all you do, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, we're continuing our series in the book of Colossians. We'll be looking through the book of Colossians for many weeks here. Just kind of going through it verse by verse. But we're in a, a passage of scripture right now that is, as we look at our Christian lives, it's almost the, the peak of our Christian life. In other words, what I mean, the foundational stuff that we need to realize and understand in our lives is right here in this passage of Scripture, and we'll be reading tonight Colossians uh, 1, verses 15 through 23. But last week I asked a question, 
And I, I would like to ask a question to start with tonight. Is Christ prominent in your life, or is he preeminent? And you may ask the question, well, what's the difference? What, what, what would be the difference of those two words, to be prominent or preeminent? Well, I guess I would answer that this way. He doesn't just want a place in our lives, but he demands first place. And it's a question for all of us to answer. Is Christ in our lives? Or is he, does he have first place in our lives? You know, I think both of those are, are true and correct. He needs to, first of all, we need to know him as our personal Savior. But I think it's really important for us to realize, does he have first place in our lives? You know, as I think of it, you know, Christ certainly does change our lives. He can change our marriages. He can change our stress levels, the way we look at things. But He can do that in our lives when we give Him first place, because then we understand His preeminence. And when we understand that preeminence, that first place in our lives, then we move away from what Jesus can do for me to am I living in light of Him. You know, we don't simply just add Jesus to our lives. We allow Him to completely change our lives. And then our lives should show obedience to Him. But let me read this passage of Scripture starting in verse 15, reading through verse 23 of Colossians chapter 1. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. And He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He may have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. He has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present your holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. You know, as we look at this book, the book of Colossae, Paul was, was writing this letter to the church at Colossae. And much of the false teaching that was taking place in Colossae had to do with the minimizing of who Jesus was. You know, Paul talks about at least three misconceptions in Colossians chapter 1 of, of who, who they were being told Jesus was. The false teachers taught that God did not create the world because in their view, matter was evil and God cannot create evil. He also is teaching to them and telling them that believing that matter was evil, they argued that God would not have come to this earth as a human in bodily form. They did not believe that Christ was the unique Son of God, but rather one of many between God and people, or the church at Colossae. Our passage that we just read breaks all of that into two sections, with the last part of verse 18 providing the overriding theme that we see here, where it says that in all things he may have preeminence. So we see it split in two ways, the supremacy of Jesus over creation, verses 15 through 17, and the supremacy of Jesus over his new creation, in verses 18 through verse 23. You know, Jesus is the head over everything that he has created, as we see that in, in the first couple of verses, verse 15 and 17. And he's preeminent over all that he has redeemed, 
in verses 18 through 23. You know, another way to say it is that he has first place over both the universe and the church. Well, tonight as we look at that, and we're just dropping back maybe a little bit to what we talked about last week. You know, he is the Lord of everything. He has made everything, and he is Lord over everything he has saved. In verse 15 through verse 17, we see this area of the supremacy of Jesus over creation. You know, this passage is one of the strongest in Scripture as it talks about how superior our Savior truly is. Let me just read those verses. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. We want to look at four truths about Jesus in these verses. The first one we see in the first part of verse 15 is he is God. You know, Paul doesn't mix any words here. Jesus is he says, is the image of the invisible God. The word image has a meaning beyond what words can describe. You know, as I explained last week, I wear a wedding band, and Denise and I, my wife, we both have wedding bands that represents that, our, that we were married, and we said yes. And that, that wedding band reminds us of an eternal circle and the importance of that. You know, when we were on a missions trip to New York City, we saw the Statue of Liberty. And, you know, as I looked at that Statue of Liberty, I thought about the history of it and what it meant. And I remember this summer standing there, listening to the National Anthem, looking at an American flag at, a, at one of our grandson's baseball games. And it gives you a real feeling of patriotism for all those that have given of their lives and their time for our freedom that we enjoy. But as powerful as those symbols are, they're simply representations of a far deeper reality. My ring doesn't make me mar married, rather it's a symbol that I am married. The Statue of Liberty doesn't in and of itself do anything. It stands for a nation that honors freedom. The American flag is a powerful national symbol, but it only represents what our country is all about. Jesus is not just a symbol of God. He is God himself. You know, that word that we see there, image, in the Greek refers to likeness, manifestation, or replica. I just said a big word, manifestation. And the easiest way I can explain it is this way to make openly known, to appear. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. He is the precise copy because He is God Himself. He both represents and manifests, there's that word again, to make openly known God to the world. Some verses that that we looked at and, and think about is John chapter 1, verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. We see that phrase, He has declared Him, which means that Jesus declares to the world that God the Father and Him are the same. John 14, 9, Jesus revealed this about Himself. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? A parallel passage in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Verse 4 says, Having become so much better, than the angels, as he has by inheritance, obtained a more excellent name than they. Another passage is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, which also refers to Christ as the image of God. 
You know, I heard a pastor on the radio once say this, that Jesus is God with skin on. You know, that's a pretty good word picture, isn't it? So we can actually see Jesus, we can see God through Jesus, his son. We also see in the second half of verse 15 that he is a unique son of God. Jesus is not only God, he is the firstborn over all creation. You know, as we, we look at that, we think of that, and, and Jehovah's Witnesses believe that this verse teaches that Jesus was a created being. So because he was a created being, he's not God. But actually, as you look at that, and we see that word firstborn, the phrase firstborn is most frequently translated as heir or owner. You know, in ancient times, it meant the ranking one or the supreme one. And this is strongly supported in Psalms chapter 89, verse 27, where we read that the God appointed King David as his firstborn, even though he was the youngest of eight brothers. You know, and the verse concludes by saying that David will be the highest of the kings of the earth. So that word firstborn is a title of honor or position, not order of birth. The next thing we see in verse 16, he is the creator of all things. It says, Jesus is the image of God and the exalted one over all creation because he is the creator. And how important that is for us to think about in our lives. Look at verse 16. For by him... All things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. I don't want anybody to under, misunderstood or misunderstand, excuse me, what that word firstborn means. Because in verse 16, Paul explains that all things were created through him and for Christ. You know, I just read that, and we just heard that, and it just kind of look at that, but Jesus is not a man. He is the creator of all things. And those things that we can see, and those things that we can't see. Throughout the context of Colossians 1, this whole passage declares that Jesus is the sovereign creator, not one who was himself created but has always existed. And because the false teachers taught that the physical world was evil, they thought that God himself could not have created it. They reasoned that if Christ were God, he would be in charge of only the spiritual world. But Paul explained that all the thrones, the dominions, the principalities, and powers on heaven and earth of both the visible and invisible world are under the authority of Christ because he created them. As we look at those that were mentioned in verse 16, those four kind of classifications that I say, can say are used many different places in the scripture to describe the world of both holy and the evil things of the earth. And since the Colossians were being taught and given favor to angels, Paul hit quickly here puts everything under the rule of Christ because Jesus has no rival. Verse 16 argues the false teaching that they were being told in the Colossian church that Christ was one of many that the angels were to worship, were to be worshiped. And even as we think about that, the highest angels are subject to Jesus Christ. Jesus is Lord of all. It says, for by him all things were created. Jesus is not only the creator, he provides the purpose for his creation. Because it says in this passage again in verse 16, all things were created through him, and who were they for? For him. You know, the goal of all creation is to glorify Christ. Revelation 4 verse 11 puts it this way, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Then we come to verse 17, where, he, where it says, And he is before all things in him. 
all things consist. He holds all things together. You know, as our country continues to be under a spiritual attack, it's important to keep in mind that Jesus holds everything together. You know, as we just read in verse 17, He is before all things, and in Him all things consist or hold together. Jesus existed before everything else, as He declared in John chapter 8, verse 58, before Abraham was I am. You know, to that phrase, all things consist or hold together means to prevent something from falling into complete chaos. Aren't we glad that he's in control? You know, this world is in enough as we call it chaos, but just think what it would be like if God wasn't in control. We read here that Christ is before all things, both in time and rank. He's not only the creator of the world, he is the glue that keeps it all together. By him everything came to be, and by him everything continues to be. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 reminds us that he holds everything together by his powerful word. You know, if he were to remove his sustaining power everything would dissolve into disorder. Hebrews 1, 3 says, "...who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they." He upholds everything by the word of his power. Remember, and I want you to remember, that there is no crisis in heaven. He will be exalted above the nations. The second thing that we see in verses 18 through verse 23 is the supremacy of Jesus over his creation. You know, Jesus is supreme over creation and what we just read in verses 15 through verse 17. But as we look now at verses 18 through 23, we discover that Jesus is also preeminent over his new creation. The focus shifts from the old natural creation to the new spiritual creation. The creating God is the reconciling God. You know, we see first that he is the head of the church in verses 18 and 19. And he is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead that in all things he may have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all fullness should dwell. It literally means he himself is the head. Only Jesus qualifies to be the head of the church. That word head means that Jesus is the authority or the source of the church. And we can relate to that. The head gives the body the ability to produce growth. And without it, the body would die. Unfortunately, today, many churches seem to forget this. If Jesus Christ is not supreme in the church, or not the head, then there is no church. And that was part of the trouble with the church of Colossae. They had lost their, somewhat of their desire, their connection to Christ. And as a result, they were experimenting with all sorts of false doctrine and sinful ways of life. You know, I just want to take a moment and say, Jesus is the head of the Mount Carmel Church. Not me, not the board, not the congregation. But Jesus Christ is supreme over the Mount Carmel Church. You know, Jesus is the beginning, which means that he is the source. The word actually has two meanings, to rule and to begin. In fact, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. You know, the church is the creation of Christ. And we must follow his lead. Because as we read in verse 18 where it says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, 
the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. We see in verse 18 this area, firstborn from among the dead, showing us that as the Supreme One, his resurrection is the guarantee that we too will rise again. You know, I really like verse 19 because it gives God the Father great joy and pleasure to have all of, as it says in verse 19, in Him all the fullness should dwell. In other words, His fullness dwell in Jesus. It greatly pleased the Father for the Son to have preeminence over creation and over the church. You know, there's three significant truths about Jesus in this verse. First, we see the fullness of God dwells in him. It wasn't around him. It wasn't upon him. It wasn't under him. Rather, it was in him. We also see the word dwell means to take up residence and point to the incarnation. It's used in the sense of a, a permanent dwelling and would remind believers of God's desire to choose a place for his name to dwell in the Old Testament. You know, Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 says, For in him dwell all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. We also see the phrase, in him, all the fullness. Paul uses this term eight different times in Colossians to show the believers that Jesus is the fullness of God and no one else. The fact that it pleased the Father to have all his fullness dwell in Christ is proof that Jesus Christ is God. You know, John chapter 1 verse 16 says, From the fullness of His grace, we have all received one blessing after another. We're going to stop there tonight as we take a look at this, and we're going to continue on through starting in verse 20 down through verse 23 next week. But I hope that you just see the importance of this preeminence in your life. Is God present? In your life, or is he preeminent in your life? Does he have a place in your life, and what place is that? Let's close in a word of prayer tonight. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for our time together. I thank you for our study in this passage of Scripture. And Lord, we just ask for your continued guidance and direction in each one of our lives. Lord, we pray for continued wisdom as we look to you. And Lord, as we see that everything around us you have created, everything, not only creation, but you are the head, the head of the church. And how important it is, Lord, to stand on your word and to allow you to speak and give us wisdom as churches today, as Christians today. Lord, we thank you for our study tonight. And Lord, we just want to lift your name up and uh, Lord, help us to make you preeminent in our lives first. No other, nobody else, nothing else there but you. Fill our hearts, Lord, for what you would have for us. Help us to glorify you each and every day in our lives. We thank you for who you are and what you have done for us. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to thank you tonight for watching and listening as we look at this area of, of just asking that question to ourselves. Is God part of our lives or is He preeminent in our lives? Or do we know God? First of all, that's the first question we need to ask and I hope you can answer it in the positive that you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. And if you do, what place does He take in your life? You know, that takes examination of our own lives, our own hearts but I pray that he is preeminent in your life. Thank you for watching and listening tonight, and may God bless.